you're not supposed to be alive. None of us are. About 10 years ago, you woke up to an eerie silence. The power was out. You went to check your phone for news, but your phone was dead. Then you realized everything was dead. Some kind of blackout, you thought. You looked out your window, confused. It looked like a normal December morning. Holiday decorations were up, though all the Christmas lights were out. You saw neighbors also peering through windows and standing on their front porches. Everyone was looking up. It looked like the stars were falling, only they weren't stars. They were satellites and space debris. It was raining fire. And for the first time in your life, you saw the Aurora Borealis in the middle of the day. You looked at the calendar. Today's date was supposed to mean something. But before you could remember, everything went black. It was December 21st, 2012, the end of the world. In early 1948, the curator for the National Museum of Iraq had a very exciting meeting. Two American archeologists walked into his office with a briefcase and set it gently on his desk next to a dusty cardboard box. The three men exchanged polite greetings and shook hands. One of the Americans dialed a code on the case, popped the locks and opened it. It was full of cash. Stacks of $100 bills, United States legal tender. Very, very nice. The curator removed the lid of what looked like an old unmarked shoebox. Inside, there were two ancient Sumerian cylinder seals. The Americans were willing to pay handsomely for these. The curator wasn't even sure why. A cylinder seal is nothing more than a tube made of stone or metal engraved with a design. They were used by everybody in Sumer. It was basically a stamp. You rolled the cylinder over a document or a piece of leather. The engraving on the cylinder imprinted its design, which served as a personal signature on a document or package. It was a way for a Sumerian to guarantee authenticity of a business deal, like signing a contract. Cylinder seals were made of wood, stone, bronze, really whatever the owner could afford. These specific cylinders were made of gold, but the curator was being paid much more than their weight in gold, many times more. The curator offered to show the American archeologists more seals, hoping for another sale. There are hundreds of them in the museum, he could make a fortune. But the Americans were only interested in these two cylinders. The curator didn't know how the Americans even knew they existed. They weren't on display in the museum at all. They'd been sitting boxed on a dusty shelf for years, but there was so much cash in that briefcase, the curator wasn't gonna ask questions. He was now a rich man, no reason to press his luck. The box and briefcase were closed, the men again shook hands, and the deal was done. An hour later, the archaeologists were settled into their seats on a C-97 stratifier. This particular strato was outfitted for passenger transport by the recently formed United States Air Force. One of the men pulled a flask from his coat with a sigh. It was going to be a long day. Refuel in London, then over the Atlantic, a quick stop at Andrews in Maryland, and then finally land at Holloman Airfield in New Mexico. He joked with his partner that his flask would also need refueling along the way. The other man opened the dusty shoebox on his lap and stared at the Sumerian cylinder seals, puzzled. They didn't look like anything important. They reminded him of metal toilet paper rolls. The engravings were just the typical ancient stuff. Men holding staffs, people sitting in chairs. There were pictures of animals, maybe oxen, and a bunch of symbols he didn't recognize. He showed the open box to his partner who had just taken a long belt from his flask. Both men shrugged. They had no idea what they were looking at. Why would they? They weren't archeologists. Hitler was fascinated with the occult and ancient relics. He believed these relics were powerful and could be used as tools to conquer Europe and beyond. Nazi archeologists searched for the Ark of the Covenant, the box that held the stone tablets of the Ten Commandments. According to scripture, the Ark was a powerful weapon and could level entire armies. In 1940, Heinrich Himmler personally led a mission to find the Holy Grail. The Grail was the cup used by Christ at the Last Supper. It's said that the Grail has the power to provide eternal youth. Hitler was fascinated with the Spear of Destiny. This was used by Roman legionary Gaius Cassius Longinus to pierce the side of Christ at the crucifixion. There were German archeological sites all over the Middle East. Hundreds of people were searching for these artifacts. Now, as far as we know, none of them were found, but in the late 1930s, ancient Sumerian cylinder seals were discovered that- yeah, the toilet paper rolls with the pitches? Yeah, a few of these seals were not Sumerian at all. They were much older. 
They were given as gifts to the Sumerians by their ancestors. You mean? Yes. Anunnaki. Correct. Yahtzee. The Anunnaki arrived on Earth 500,000 years ago, seeking gold to repair their planet's atmosphere. They genetically engineered primitive humans to mine the gold. About 12,000 years ago, there was a global cataclysm. Some kind of event melted the polar ice caps and caused a great flood. This was either an asteroid impact or more likely a major solar event. The flood caused sea levels to rise 400 feet and changed the face of the Earth. Millions of square miles of land were submerged. Cities were destroyed. The entire human race was almost wiped out. You can see this flood myth depicted in every ancient culture. The myth usually ends with a godlike figure emerging from the sea or from the sky to help mankind restart civilization. The Anunnaki gave the Sumerians instructions to escape extinction. These instructions are carved on the cylinder seals. When rolled in the proper sequence, the cylinders outlined a procedure to access naturally occurring wormholes. Now, these are portals, sometimes called stargates, that allow you to move to various points in space instantly. And there are about 50 of them all over the world. And since the cylinders were found to be alien, they were transferred to a group called Majestic 12. Majestic 12 was established in 1947 to take charge of the technical, biological, and all aspects of crashed UFOs. MJ-12 soon learned that UFO technology was compatible with the information on the Sumerian cylinders. By combining the ancient Stargate instructions with alien technology, MJ-12 was able to build a machine. But the machine was more powerful than anyone could imagine. It was powerful enough to destroy the planet. And in 2012, it did. On a warm spring day in 1994, Dan landed at Homey Airport in the middle of the Nevada desert. He had just taken the weirdest flight of his life. There were hardly any passengers on the white Boeing 737 that took off from McCarran Airport in Las Vegas. The few people that were there were seated far apart and instructed to not talk to each other. Despite the strict rules, the pilot was pretty friendly. Over the PA, he thanked them for choosing Janet Airlines and then joked that they really had no choice at all. Then he played Coming to America over and over again. Uh, from Neil Diamond? Yep. Everywhere around the world, they come into America. You're probably just going to keep... Every time that flags unfurled, they come into America. Today. That's enough. Ooh, ooh, can we do Love and Iraq's next? This guy just landed at Area 51, and you want to do Neil Diamond karaoke? The human makes a good point. Please continue. Dan was a microbiologist and accepted an offer to work on a top-secret government program called Project Aquarius. Aquarius operated at an underground facility called Papoose Lake. On-base employees called the building S4. S4 was about 12 miles from Area 51. Dan was taken there by Apache helicopter. He was then escorted to the building by a polite but very serious military officer dressed in desert camo. Dan assumed he was an officer. He wore no designation of rank. In fact, his uniform had no designations of any kind. No rank, no branch, no patches, nothing. The man didn't even have a name patch. The officer didn't offer his name and Dan didn't ask. Security measures at S4 were intense. Armed guards were everywhere. Every door required voice print identification or a retinal scan. Every day he'd have to go through a decontamination procedure, including a change of clothes, shower, and a shave. The floors of S4 were painted with parallel lines, one blue and the other red. Dan was told to stay within the blue lines and to never cross a red line. Guards were ordered to shoot to kill anyone who crossed a red line. The good stuff is behind the red line, ain't it? Will you let me paint the picture here? Sorry, sorry, I'm just excited, go ahead. S4 had five floors, but you had to walk down from level one to level four. The only elevator in the building was on level four, which was the only way in or out of level five. On level one, Dan was given his security badge and shown the cafeteria. The dining hall had four round tables, each assigned to a different project team. He was to eat with the Aquarius team at their table. Meal times were staggered to minimize contact, but he was still reminded to not speak with members of any other project. The long hallway on level one passed a number of hangar bays on Dan's left. The hangars were on the other side of the red line. I knew it. 
The first few hangers were empty, but then Dan walked past the hanger that changed his life forever. He saw a disc-shaped object, a flying saucer. Later, Dan would learn this was a P-45 craft. A few more empty hangers and then another flying saucer. This one was a different type, a P-52. The last hanger held a craft shaped like a triangle. It was flat black and hovering a few feet off the ground. Level 3 was offices, conference rooms, and living quarters. Level 4, the Aquarius floor, was Dan's new lab. There, he was finally read into the project. Up until now, he didn't know what he'd be doing. He was just told it was exciting, important, and very top secret. As a microbiologist, he would be analyzing alien biology. Tissue samples, DNA, everything. Uh, hold on, I uh, skipped level two. Right. Level two was strange. It was known as Alice's floor. Alice, fr- from the Brady Bunch? No. Oh, from Mel's Diner? No. From Alice in Wonderland. Oh. Project Galileo was on this floor. That dealt with propulsion systems from alien aircraft. Level 4 was also home to Project Sidekick, an alien weapons program. On Level 4, Dan saw a small plastic statue hanging above a door. It was a statue of the White Rabbit from Alice in Wonderland. The rabbit was wearing a red vest and holding a pocket watch. And if you follow the White Rabbit through that door, just like Alice, you step through the looking glass and into another world. Inside the Project Looking Glass lab was a machine. The exterior of the device was a circular ring about 5 feet tall and 10 feet wide. It's made of a dark gray metal alloy with a smooth finish. This ring forms the outer shell. Inside the circular outer ring is a core made of several spinning rings. Think of the object in the movie Contact. It looked just like that, just on a smaller scale. These spinning rings were lined with powerful electromagnets. These created fluctuating electromagnetic fields around the center chamber. At the heart of the machine was a rotating metal barrel lined with quartz crystals. This central barrel is suspended inside the spinning rings using gyroscopes and a gimbal mechanism. And inside the barrel is a chair for the operator. Yeah, to do what? Well, a few things. It really depends on the operator. Yeah, to follow. Well, over time, as the technology became more understood, the machines could be adjusted to do various things to warp space-time. Looking glass technology was used during the Philadelphia experiment. That project failed, but later the Montauk project was launched. And researchers learned that if a person with certain mental abilities was integrated with the technology, it could be controlled. Operators learned to see any place on Earth. You've heard this called remote viewing. All the operator would have to do is think of a place, and that place could be seen. Now, this was useful for intelligence gathering, but it was extremely helpful in locating more ancient Sumerian cylinders. As more cylinder seals were discovered, they added more capabilities to the machines. MJ-12 knew there were more cylinders out there, but the political climate was making them harder to acquire. Remember, the cylinder seals are Sumerian. Sumer is now Iraq. But the United States still found ways to access the artifacts. Just two hours ago, Allied Air Forces began an attack on military targets in Iraq and Kuwait. These attacks continue as I speak. Ground forces are not engaged. I'm hopeful that this fighting will not go on for long and that casualties will be held to an absolute minimum. We have before us the opportunity to forge for ourselves and for future generations a new world order. Oh, come on, the U.S. started a war to steal old museum stuff. No, the U.S. military wouldn't be so blatant and obvious. For three days in April 2003, looters rampaged in the storerooms and galleries of Iraq's National Museum. At this hour, American and coalition forces are in the early stages of military operations to disarm Iraq, to free its people, and to defend the world from grave danger. Making off with some 15,000 priceless objects. These are opening stages of what will be a broad and concerted campaign. Many dated back thousands of years to the great civilizations of Babylon and Mesopotamia. A few years later, cylinders were found in Libya. Good morning, and we are interrupting Good Morning America here on the East Coast, your regular program on the West Coast, because we have learned reports from Libya that Muammar Gaddafi, the leader of Libya for more than 40 years, has been killed by rebel forces. Back on Alice's floor in the S-4 building, technology from crashed UFOs was found to be compatible with the looking glass devices. 
Using this advanced technology, the looking glass operator could do more than see any place on Earth. The operator could see any time on Earth, the past, present, and the future. And if the operator was really talented, not only could he see the future, he could change it. The CIA has always been interested in psychics and psychic abilities. A psychic who could see anywhere on Earth is the ideal spy. Psychics were also useful for looking glass devices. In the 1980s and 90s, psychics were recruited or abducted for this purpose. A chair recovered from an extraterrestrial craft had technology that let the pilot sync his consciousness with the craft. This technology was integrated into the looking glass machines. The psychic operator would sit in the chair at the center of the looking glass device and activate the machine. The startup sequence charged the electromagnets surrounding the central core that were calibrated in specific ways depending on the mission. Then xenon and argon gas were injected into the rotating barrel. A grayish orb would form in front of the operator within the gas. This was a stable wormhole to the probability dimension. That sounds made up, but I love it. What the hell are you talking about? The looking glass machine allowed the user to see past, present, and future. Seeing the past is interesting, but seeing the future, that's useful. But not only could you see the future, you could see possibilities of the future. The operator would mentally focus on an action. The operator could then see the probable outcome of this action. Like what would happen if we invaded this country? Or what would happen if this particular person was assassinated? The output was captured by cameras and relayed to view screens. The researchers could feed questions to the operator and instantly see the results. This was highly useful. What they reported seeing covered an enormous range, from disaster events and weather anomalies to political outcomes and earth changes. Soon, looking glass operators learned how to steer events toward a specific goal. There was a problem though. Different operators would see different things depending on their own biases. Like a Christian looking backwards will see the crucifixion of Christ. Atheists would just see Jerusalem. Looking forward was the same problem. Operators were seeing different future outcomes. Physicists and computer scientists were brought in to develop software to stabilize the process. Computer programs could feed the operator a lot of questions very quickly, and the results would come back fast. It worked and it was useful. For a few years, thousands of choices were fed to operators and thousands of possible timelines were seen. But in the late 1990s, MJ-12 and its scientists became very nervous. They had many different psychic operators seeing all kinds of different future events, but none of them could see anything past 2012, specifically December 21st, 2012. The Mayan calendar ends on that date. All timelines converged on that date. And then nothing. There was nothing after that. Ah, uh, this isn't a good sign. It's not. But the scientists had help. Not only did they have a P-52 spacecraft, they had the pilot. Ah. They called him a P-52 as in present plus 52. He was from 52,000 years in the future. Holy sh And the P-52 alien? He was human. On May 21st, 1953, a team of Air Force scientists were sent to a UFO crash site eight miles northwest of Kingman, Arizona. One of these scientists was Arthur Stanzel, who signed an affidavit stating that he was an eyewitness to the Kingman UFO recovery operation. The craft had a brushed aluminum exterior and was about 30 feet wide. Inside were swivel seats, instruments, and display panels. Witnesses saw several bodies. They were about four feet tall with dark skin. They had small bodies and big heads with large black eyes. One of these beings was alive and taken to Area 51. He was from 52,000 years in the future, so he was classified a P-52. Bang, 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 on the door, baby, bang, bang, do, do. I can't hear you! Bang, bang, you know, I prefer their earlier stuff, yeah, Rag Lobster, Planet Clear. Yeah, me too. The P-52 alien was nicknamed J-Rod. J-Rod? Sounds like a hip-hop artist or a basketball player. Well, his personal name was Kaela. J-Rod was his race. Specifically, Kaela was a P-52 J-Rod. Got it. Kaela was based in the Gliese system, in the direction of the constellation Aquarius. That's how Project Aquarius got its name. Now, although he was based in Gliese, Kaela was originally from the Zeta Reticuli system. Zeta Reticuli is well known to UFO researchers. In 1961, Betty and Barney Hill were abducted by beings who said they were from Zeta Reticuli. 
Betty wasn't an astronomer or scientist of any kind. Still, she was able to draw a star map of Zeta Reticuli, which is a binary star system. Her map also includes Gliese. Kaela's people were dealing with an illness that was devastating the population. His crew was one of many sent back in time to Earth to try to find a cure. The P-52 aliens are somewhat genetically compatible with humans. In their timeline, they're an offshoot of Homo sapiens. Kaela was eventually allowed to go home, but he spent years at Area 51. He helped save humanity from destruction in 2012. But MJ-12 didn't realize that the 2012 apocalyptic event wasn't an accident. It was supposed to happen. It was engineered to happen. Uh, engineered by you. Another race of future humans. The Stargate technology on the Sumerian cylinders is said to be a gift to humanity, but it's not a gift, it's a weapon. And on a different timeline, it destroyed us. There's a timeline where on December 21st, 2012, a disaster took place. There was a massive geophysical pole shift of almost five degrees. The shift was caused by the Earth's upper mantle reacting to a massive explosion of energy from the sun. This shift caused a chain reaction in the Earth's tectonic plates. The Earth trembled with an intensity never before recorded. Cities near the epicenters of these shifts were the first to feel the effects. Buildings designed to withstand earthquakes crumbled like sandcastles. The seismic waves radiated outward, reaching every part of the planet. No one was safe. As the crust shifted, it wasn't just land that was affected. Under the ocean, the violent movement of the seabed caused enormous tsunamis. Coastal cities were obliterated by walls of water rushing at tremendous speeds. Inland, the story was just as grim. Landslides and sinkholes swallowed entire towns. Mountains that had stood for millions of years crumbled. In other places, land was thrust upward, creating new mountain ranges. Dormant volcanoes came to life with explosive eruptions. The atmosphere around the entire planet was filled with ash. The sky went black. In the aftermath, the Earth was unrecognizable. The geography of the continents was completely different. Some land masses fractured into islands. Other land masses merged. New seas were created from cracks in the Earth. Some ancient rivers changed course. Others were just gone. Countries struggled to assess the damage and coordinate aid. Critical infrastructure was destroyed, and global communication networks no longer functioned. This global cataclysm killed two-thirds of the world's population and led to the extinction of many species. The surface of the Earth was in ruin. The volcanic ash had poisoned the atmosphere and blocked sunlight for years. The entire food chain collapsed. But humans didn't go extinct. The survivors went underground and rebuilt civilization. Over thousands of years, our ability to manipulate time and space grew more and more powerful. We could alter our DNA in real time. We can manipulate our physical form. The form that was most beneficial for surviving underground was a smaller, thinner body. Our brains grew larger, so did our skulls. Large, dark eyes helped us see in the darkness. We became what are described as the greys. The greys we see now aren't aliens, they're us. 45,000 years in the future. Majestic 12 calls them P-45s. P-45s, future humans, were able to unlock a lot of potential from the human brain. They learned telepathic communication and how to manipulate space and time with thought. But this evolution had a downside. Future humans lost their humanity. They became emotionless and cold. They became selfish drones interested only in serving their own needs. People who've been abducted by greys describe them exactly like this, uncaring and almost robotic. They're experimenting on humans to improve their own future. The experiments focus on human DNA analysis and how that can be spliced with P45 DNA or even other animals' DNA in order to improve their own genetic future. But here's where it gets scary. The P45 Greys wanted that cataclysm to happen in 2012. They still want it. They need it to happen so they can come into existence. Yeah, yeah, yeah but it didn't happen. No, it didn't. Kaela, the P52 alien, had the looking glass machines turned off for a few years. Why? Well, it was using this technology that created the disaster in 2012. The artificial wormholes were disrupting the magnetic energy of the sun. Uh, so we're safe now, right? Oh no, we're not safe. We're not safe at all. 
The Greys either are or are controlling the Illuminati. The Illuminati still want this disaster to happen. Fewer people on the planet means they have more control. Eat bugs, live in a pod, oh nothing and be happy. Exactly. And keep people terrified of overpopulation by controlling world leaders and use the media to disseminate propaganda. All to create fear, so hatred and ideally lead us to nuclear war. There is another timeline split coming in 2030. One timeline shows humanity awakening. This timeline ushers in a new era of peace. Humanity learns telepathy, and all the lies we've been told are suddenly revealed. If you have questions about who killed JFK or what happened on 9-11, you'll know. Every deception will be exposed, like a cloud lifting from over our entire species. Or there's the other timeline, where there's a disaster. And if you're lucky enough to survive, your role will be one of servitude. You'll be enslaved by the powerful simply to survive. Right now, there's a secret war being fought. On one side, the P-52s and a few white hat operators in the military and the government steering us toward timeline one, the positive timeline. On the other side, the P-45s, the Illuminati and the world's elites pushing us toward timeline two, the apocalypse. If you look for it, you can see them preparing. In all of history, there have never been more underground bunkers being built. It's said that underneath Denver Airport will be their new headquarters. This will be one of the many safe places around the world where those in power can wait out the coming storm. Uh, we're not one of those people, are we? We are not, and neither are you. If we end up on the wrong timeline, we're doomed. Timeline one, peace, compassion, and kindness. Timeline two, chaos, war, and hatred. Which path do you think we're on? The story of Project Looking Glass comes from three whistleblowers, Bob Lazar, Bill Wood, and Dan Burrish. Most of today's story was from Dan, and it has everything. Time traveling aliens fighting for the future of humanity. I mean, it's a ride. But is it true? Well, the stories like this, you know, time travel to the future, you can't really debunk them, at least not fully. But we can look at the people telling the story. First off, this episode was difficult to write because a lot of the stories contradict each other. Are humans from Earth and we eventually leave and become P-whatevers? Or humans were brought here from somewhere else? There are contradictions. Dan Burris tells a wild story, and he tells it well, and with feeling. But he has his detractors. Before he was Dan Burris, he was Dan Crane. He says he worked at the underground S4 lab near Area 51. This place was made public by Bob Lazar. Lazar said anyone who believes this guy should be ashamed of themselves. He said he never met this knucklehead. Knucklehead? His words. Dan said that he worked with an alien and they became friends. He also said he met angels in the lab and spoke to them in Hebrew. He claimed to be in the military with the rank of captain, but there's no record of that. He said he got his PhD in 1990 from Stony Brook University in New York. When Stony Brook said they never heard of him, he said they covered up his records. It was discovered that during the time that he said he was working at the S4 lab, he was actually working as a parole officer in Las Vegas. There's documentation of this. When that was uncovered, he said that was his cover job, and he got his PhD by flying back and forth to New York on the weekends. And the government paid for all this. Stony Brook said this is ridiculous. His finances show he wasn't earning much money working at a top secret lab. He said he wasn't paid in money, but he was taken care of. Hey, what does that mean? No idea. He wasn't that well taken care of. He filed for bankruptcy in 2002. His listed occupation was homemaker, and he had assets of about $300 plus one 1997 Suzuki that wasn't fully paid for. Now, none of this means he's lying, but when you tell a story like this, people are going to pay attention, and they're going to look into the person telling the story. As people looked into Dan, he went on the defensive over and over. He's been challenged by George Norrie to take a lie detector test. He won't. A lot of the investigation was done by George Knapp. George Knapp knows his way around a UFO story, and he doesn't buy this one. What really pisses me off is when I get told what has or has not happened to me by these people. They have no right to open their mouth. I'm sorry for screaming at you. It sounds like Dan is building off of Bob Lazar's story. He also sounds like he built on the story told by Bill Uhouse, who was the first to mention J-Rods. But Dan has added a lot of science fiction tropes. 
He's jammed so many details into his story that it reads like the syllabus for a conspiracy course. Illuminati, every kind of alien ever mentioned, men in black, bases on the moon, time travel, lizard people, lizard. and on and on. I've noticed that many of the people who tell these stories tend to pack in all this stuff. It makes it harder to believe. Bob Lazar doesn't weave an elaborate tale about lizard people. Lizard. He talks about the projects he personally worked on. Now you can believe his story or not, I find him one of the more believable whistleblowers. And the time travel stuff doesn't make sense. Dan says there are timelines that branch off, but the aliens come back in time to affect their future. 1.21 gigawatts! Right. If time travel works like the movie Back to the Future, then there's only one timeline. But he says there are branching timelines in a multiverse. So which is it? Another reason to be skeptical is, believers in this story say that the chronovisor is a looking glass device. That's a machine that allows you to see through time. It's allegedly kept in the Vatican secret archives. It was developed by Father Pellegrino Ernetti in the early 1950s. Father Ernetti even took pictures of Christ using the chronovisor. Now, I can't prove the chronovisor is fake, but I do know that the pictures were fake. These same believers also refer to the book by Chan Thomas, The Adam and Eve Story. The book describes a pole shift apocalypse. This was such a dangerous book that it was allegedly classified by the CIA, and only a small portion of the book has ever been seen. Well, I've covered the Adam and Eve story before. Spoiler alert, I debunk it. So if believers of the Project Looking Glass story are using debunked stories as their foundation, I'm already going in skeptical. On the other hand, it's interesting that Zeta Reticuli and Gliese came up. Zeta Reticuli is about 39 light years away, and the two stars are similar to ours. Astronomers are looking for exoplanets there because the system might be able to support life. But Zeta Reticuli was part of Betty Hill's abduction story, so it makes sense that a hoaxer would add that detail. But Gliese was an interesting choice. Gliese 581 is a dwarf star about 20 light years away, so relatively close. Three exoplanets have been found there, and Gliese 581c is possibly in the habitable zone and could support life. At the time, it was called the most Earth-like of all known exoplanets. It was discovered in 2007, so maybe Dan heard about it in the news. But if he'd heard about Gliese from an alien, you'd think he'd know how to pronounce it. In 2008, a radio signal was sent to Gliese 581c. It's called a message from Earth, or AMFE, and it contains 501 different messages. The signal will reach the planet in early 2029. Just before the next timeline switch. Yeah, I noticed that too. Whether you believe this specific story or not, I think you can feel that something is happening. I feel it. Dan's story might be far-fetched, but there's plenty of evidence that the CIA and other black ops programs have experimented with psychics, remote viewing, and even time travel. We know that they did this. So we have to stay diligent, just in case a timeline shift is coming. So pay close attention to the powerful elites. Which timeline are they steering us toward? The future is not just happening. The future is built by us, by a powerful community as you here in this room. Do they want us to have more freedom, more safety and more unity? Or do the elites and the media who serve them want to remove our freedoms one by one? If we do as we're told, humanity will finally be united, live in peace and prosper. Ha! Well, that's what they say. Do you feel safer today than a few years ago? Do you feel more united with people? Is the earth a peaceful place? 2030 is only a few years away and it's coming fast, but we still have time. We still have a chance to steer humanity toward the positive timeline. The powerful don't want that to happen, they want us to hate each other and destroy each other. They want chaos and war, and ideally, a world war. And from the ashes and rubble of their war, they will build a new world, their world, without us. Whether you believe the two timeline story or not, something is happening. The lines have been drawn, and it's time for you to pick a side.